IQ and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice in College Park, Maryland. Something new for Forensic Week uh, uh, this evening. I have our guest right here uh, in our um, our studio at home, rather than him being in another location. I'll introduce Chris uh, Faber to, to you in a moment. But uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, firearms in toolbox identification. You know, back in 1910, Edmund Lockhart, a Frenchman who created the first known crime laboratory in the world, did it in France. He developed a principle for evidence examination, and that principle was when two objects touch each other, they take on characteristics of each other. Here lies the basis for firearms and tool marks identification and evidence, and on this show we have both uh, with us, excuse me, a firearms identification and tool mark expert from Baltimore Police Crime Laboratory, uh, Christopher Faber. Chris, thank Faber, you very Faber. much How for being doing? here. Nice Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, Faber is, uh, yes, German, and then Faber is the Americanized. Place. So what do you like? Other way. Okay. We'll well, call I like you. a lot of things, but uh, Faber will be fine. I'll call you Faber. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you who've been, who are watching the show um, uh, all the time may remember episode 15, way back on March 19, 2013, our second season. Uh, we did a show called Gun Safety Identification and Awareness. We actually did the show um, several weeks after there was a shooting uh, on the uh, College Park campus. Anyways, we had Bo Molden, uh, our guest, and uh, what we did on that show is we showed the various types of guns for purposes of identification. So we've done that show. So if you're interested in learning the different kinds of guns, what they look like, how they work, then go back to episode 15 uh, whenever you want, um, and you'll be able to see approximately 60 or 70 different kinds of guns. And uh, Bo will talk to you about each one, uh, how they fire, um, and the evidential value. But this evening, firearms identification and toolbox, we're going to focus on firearms in reference to the evidence. What evidence is left at the crime scene? What do we need uh, to get a proper identification? What information is derived from it? And what kinds of evidence are we really talking about when we talk about uh, firearms identification and tool marks? And why is the term tool marks um, always talked about together with firearms identification? Let me introduce our ForensicWeek.com crew this evening. Uh, we have Laura Pachuki, uh, the producer of our show, who graduates this weekend from George Washington University, uh, getting her master's degree in forensic sciences. Uh, Laura, congratulations to you. I know it's uh, you've been working hard, uh, working, going to school, uh, working with us here at Forensic Week. Uh, uh, congratulations to you. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Jamal Francis, a University of Maryland undergraduate student, much younger than Laura, a uh, sociology <laughs> major who is a, a student intern uh, with us at Forensic IQ and our co-producer. Uh, Jamal uh, will be uh, graduating at the University of Maryland next week, I believe graduation is. Yep. And both he and Laura have indicated, even though they're graduating, uh, they are going to stick with us for a while uh, in Forensic Week as, as long as uh, they can uh, as they are seeking out employment around the uh, around the uh, Baltimore, Washington area. So, Laura and Jamal, congratulations to both of you, and especially uh, thank you very much for all you do for ForensicWeek.com. Laura, would you please tell our viewers how to ask questions, make comments, and keep watching? Sure, Tom. Thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Pachuki. If you want to email us at ForensicWeek at gmail.com with any comments, ideas, or suggestions for future shows, please do so. You can also follow us at Forensic Week on Twitter um, and send us any questions you have for tonight's show. We'll bring that up on air and ask our guest for you. You can also email us at ForensicWeek at gmail.com. Please find us on Facebook at ForensicWeek.com show. Like and share our page. Thanks and back to you, Tom. Thank you, Laura. Folks, you're watching ForensicWeek.com, a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists, educators, law enforcement, and legal professionals who find, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live on your desktop and mobile devices on Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live on your our YouTube channel, www.forensicweek.com. We're now the hangout10.com live TV webcast network. 
which is a series of shows brought to you live using Google Plus, a social networking service. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now uh, Christopher Faber. Uh, Chris served 16 years as a Philadelphia police officer. His forensic career in firearms and tool mark discipline began while with the Philadelphia Police Department. In 2005, we uh, were lucky enough here in Maryland uh, to have him join the Baltimore Police Department Firearms Examination Unit. Uh, he, um, he sits here before you with 18 years of experience as a firearms and tool mark examiner. Chris, uh, we had uh, the pleasure, I had the pleasure of meeting you with Bo Molden yes, uh, at, yes. in your office and uh, when we were uh, uh, trying to get some ammunition for my lab yes. uh, for my students and we asked you to come here. You know, um, in the 75 shows we had, I have, I have not been able to get a firearms expert on the show, so we're really, really happy oh, to have great. you. Oh, great. I'm the first one. Yeah, you guys hide wow. somewhere. I don't know. I'm, I don't maybe know. you're just bashful, generally? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, we are bashful with firearms. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> what I wanted to you know, again, our, our guests, a lot of my students, a lot, a lot of people are trying to understand this. A lot of general public who watch this show uh, know they, they get duped by CSI on television and they would really like to know, you know, what's the story behind the story? What is, uh, uh, what can we really learn? So let's first, there's, I, I always tell my students there's a problem with the words firearms identification and ballistics. They tend to be used interchangeably. That's correct. And technically they really, really aren't. So no, really can, not. can you make a distinction between the two? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll, can I make a shout out real quick to... Uh, absolutely. I wanted to say something earlier. I want to say uh, hi to my, uh, to my children, Kristen. Kyle and Nicholas, and then to my uh, girlfriend Kathy Sands up in Boyertown with her and her family, and of course to the the uh, the lab at uh, Baltimore City Police. Are they watching so, too? Oh, who knows? I don't know. They'll probably be laughing at me in the morning, so I'll know <laughs> if they are or not. Okay. But anyway, welcome. welcome. Yes, there is a difference between firearms identification and. Uh, and ballistics. Uh, firearms identification uh, is what the name implies. So I'm responsible for identifying and examining firearms and firearm related evidence, the test fire of firearms, and uh, the examination on a comparison microscope to compare uh, evidence against other questioned evidence, looking at those striations, which we'll probably briefly talk about, those accidental impression striations, characteristics from the manufacturer uh, during the manufacturing process. Okay, so when when you remove a, a bullet from a body and you examine it against um, a test fired bullet from a suspect uh, gun or a gun. If I have a firearm, yes. If you have a firearm. That is called firearms identification. So yes, it, sir. It's, it, it's examining ammunition with the weapon that you believe may have fired that ammunition. That's correct. Okay. Uh, what we call the question, uh, uh, if we have a firearm that comes in as evidence, so we'll test fired uh, and compare those test shots against the, any other questioned evidence that came from the scene, came from the, from the victim, or whatever the case may be. But mm -hmm. ballistics uh, is, a, is a misnomer for us. Uh, ballistics uh, uh, is basically the study of a projectile in flight. That's why basically that's the bottom line of what ballistics is. So uh, other than knowing some of the basics of how a projectile, uh, where it was once a bullet, uh, but once it leaves the barrel is now a projectile because of its all has its marks from the rifled barrel, given it a spin, a left hand or right hand twist from the barrel. And, it, and, and we're going to we're going to show a series of okay. slides in a little while. Okay. But, but, yeah. all right. So give me an example of evidence or information that would help an investigator that would be characterized ballistics? Uh, ballistics. Well, yes. what we need is, uh, it depends on the type of uh, condition of the scene. Obviously, we need the uh, any fire cartridge cases, the bullet specimens, any information as to where, if, uh, where those cartridge cases may have fell if we have a semi-automatic. Uh, or if they were manually ejected and extracted or extracted ejected out of the revolver. Uh, shotgun, we need, what's very important, what you, the kind of question you ask is with a shotgun, uh, anything that looks like it could be from a shot shell, such as uh, paper cardboard waddings uh, or any type of uh, pellets and so forth, and uh, and where they were found to get an idea if we get, uh, if we get questioned into, or is a request to 
determine how far away the uh, the person handling the firearm was from okay, the victim so, or from its location. So if you're attempting to determine how far away a firearm was to a target or a, or a victim, that would be considered a ballistics examination. Well, ballistics. So like I said, we don't we don't really say ballistics uh, per se. Because Why is that word more commonly used than the proper term? <laughs> uh, it's it's I don't know actually. Uh, I know from Hollywood, yeah, ballistics. Uh, it's funny how when when firearms identification came to become more uh, noticed and more accepted back in 1920s, back in the 1920s from uh, from one of the founders, uh, the Calvin Goddard, basically the, the one of the, the father of firearms identification from Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, people still use the term ballistics, as far as I, I know, uh, but it really is a misnomer because unless, I mean, we have to know the basics, Tom, with, of course, uh, the trajectory and flight and, and a little bit of physics, um, you know, how with the bullet spinning, how fast it goes and so on, depending on the caliber, depending on the firearm and the powder that's in the cartridge case, just to name a few things. Okay. But we oh. do more than just that. I mean, we uh, we have to know some of the basics, but yeah, it's always been like a mess. Now, we're trying to uh, tell people, especially students who come into the into the laboratory or those who are interested in, in firearms, uh, that ballistics, you always hear that mostly on TV. It sounds, you know, a lot of people say, well, it actually sounds cooler. Mm -hmm. Ballistics sounds cooler than firearms identification, uh, but it's there really are two different things. All right, now firearms identification, ballistics are always put together with tool marks. Now some people yes. are confused by that. Tell yeah. us what is what are tool marks mm -hmm. and why are they all in one unit? Well, tool marks are also like uh, striations and characteristic markings from a firearm, uh, because the manufacturer, it, we're looking at the manufacturer accidental impression serrations during the process of manufacturing that firearm from, let's say, from a simple block of steel to its finished product. Okay, and with tool marks, a same type of same type of thing. So like for example, uh, hammers, uh, flathead screwdrivers. Uh, there are accidental striations or marks that are left behind during the manufacturing process that makes them unique. Uh, if you look at one uh, a piece of a tool, like I said, a screwdriver is a good example, a flathead, uh, and look under the microscope, you'll see these fine striated patterns, and uh, and they can be utilized uh, under the microscope to compare against uh, any other evidence from the scene. Let's say uh, it's being it was used to pry open a window. Uh, or used to uh, uh, stab a, a victim, where there's some some marks on the body or on the bone surface, uh, and there's that's, that's what we're looking for. So because there's unique striated patterns and uh, uh, characteristics from the manufacturing process is the bottom line, why the two uh, are interchangeable. Okay, um, uh, Laurie, if you would, if you could put up our first slide, I think it'll be better for the uh, viewers to. Uh, to visualize some of the things we're talking about. You sure. talk about stri uh, striations, yes, sir. Uh, which are, are markings caused by movement. When yes. one object uh, comes in contact with movement, uh, you have a striation. The other type of a tool mark would be an impression, an where, impression right. where an object uh, kind of hits the object uh, at a 90 degree angle. Yes, uh, for a tool mark, uh, exactly right, Tom, and also uh, an impression when a fired cartridge case uh, it slams to the breech face or the rear of the firearm where the firing pin protrudes, mm -hmm. and it leaves and those manufacturer marks that are on the breech face of the firearm gets impressed onto the rear of the cartridge case, and that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking under the scope of all those, not just the firing pin impression, whereas the firing pin can leave also its impression from the tip of the firing pin, uh, any abnormalities on the firing pin, and of course on the firearm itself, uh, whether it be accidental or or they was modified uh, or you know tampered with, okay. and can also leave its uh, unique impressions on my on my evidence. All right, um, Laura just put up our first slide, and okay. let's tell the audience why that's not a bullet. <laughs> well, what's not? Which one's not a? They're both the whole, not a bullet. The whole thing. Actually, it's a cartridge. A bullet is actually that uh, where you see number one, the projectile or a bullet. It's actually not a bullet or a projectile until it's fired. Okay, once it goes through the barrel of a firearm and. Uh, then it becomes a projectile, but as a uh, but what you're looking at are the four main components of a cartridge. Uh, as you see here, you have the uh, you have the cartridge case, which is what's left behind after it's fired, and you have unless the, it's a revolver. 
Well, well, you have a cartridge case. Yeah, it, unless say unless it's the revolver of the cartridge cases stay, whether it's lo- whether it's fired or unfired, stays in the cylinder in the chambers of the cylinder of a revolver until it's manually extracted and ejected by the person handling the firearm. Mm-hmm. Where opposed to the semi-automatic firearm, the uh, slide assembly uh, on a set of rails on a frame of the firearm does basically the work for the person handling the firearm. Once the slide is pulled to the rear on the spring tension, falls forward, and then when the firing pin is, is, uh, is uh, released uh, from the pull of the trigger, it, uh, it, the, the parts of the firearm, an extractor, an ejector, it all ha- everything handles with all the pressure with the cartridge case going to the rear, an extractor and ejector takes that cartridge case out of the firearm, out of its ejection port, and it comes out of the firearm. So the difference is, revolver stays, Semi-automatic, it does the work for you. So obviously, uh, when a semi-automatic is used in, a, in, in the commission of a crime, it tends to leave more forensic evidence behind, possibly. Uh, it, it can, because it can. now we're looking at uh, extractor and ejector marks. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're looking at uh, chamber marks because of the pressures of that cartridge case expanding against the chamber walls of a firearm. Uh, in, this, in a semi-automatic in the rear of the barrel, in a revolver, uh, of course, in the chamber uh, of the cylinder. So I'm looking at the totality of all these components. Uh, as I said, I have the cartridge case, which is very important. Uh, you, have the, you have the primer inside, which turns from a solid into a gas. Once the, uh, once the, uh, the powder turns it from a solid into a gas, once the primer is indented by the firing pin, and, uh, and then the, the bullet turns into a projectile because it's being forced out of its seat of position down its barrel to its directed target. So all together is a cartridge, sometimes called a round. A round. People know as ammunition, a round, cartridges. Yeah. Uh, other people, you always hear people say, I have bullets, but it's really a uh, bullet is actually just what's seated in, inside the cartridge case. Okay. And it's a projectile, actually, when, it, uh, when the uh, bearing surface makes contact with the rifling in the barrel. Okay, bring us to the next slide, Laura. While she's doing that, okay. They, they come all in, in all shapes and sizes. Oh my gosh! Okay. Yes. Yes. And so, we get all kinds. You know, in in a, in 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 a few seconds, just give us a key <laughs> on on the different calibers versus millimeters, uh, um, and uh, I assume that your lab has to have a library of of ammunition, so when you find a, a suspect gun, you have to test fire it. And I assume that uh, to uh, get a a test fired bullet, you have to have the same kind of ammunition that you think possibly was used. Well, we, we when we test fire a firearm, we like to use the same type of ammunition uh, that was that came in as evidence with the firearm. Uh, however, sometimes it's not possible because some of the cartridges that we receive, uh, we just don't have uh, in the lab, or it's obsolete. It's uh, what's the most common uh, that you're seeing out in the streets today? Well, we have, as you see here on the bottom of that that screen, you see three thirty-eight, three eighty-nines, forty forty-fives. Those uh, are the most common that we receive on a regular basis. Uh, we we have been seeing a recent. Uh, spike in uh, revolver cartridges, such as your 38, 357, uh, uh, because because of CSI, because of the media, the the friendly shows that you see on TV, uh, people are finding out uh, they're becoming uh, uh, becoming intelligent with knowing that. In a revolver, you can run with the revolver. You can run with the cartridges, as opposed to having them land on the ground. So they're taking them with them. Do you do you believe that suspects may prefer a revolver for that reason? Uh, well, usually, suspects will take whatever get they can really? find on the black market. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we receive all types of firearms, whether they be a lower quality to a very higher quality firearm. It doesn't matter. It's whatever they get their hands on, whatever you want to spend the money on. Uh, but however, keep in mind now, Tom, I mean, there's so much ammunition that comes in, so many different types, uh, that it, it, sometimes it can be overwhelming. And sometimes I have to research because if sometimes a cartridge comes in, it's an obsolete uh, caliber or something we're not familiar with too often. Uh, and keep in mind also, these calibers you see down here, uh, it used to be a time when I could see, I could find a, um, I could see a nine millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case, mm-hmm. cartridges, and I could automatically make an assumption that that's from a semi-automatic firearm. 
However, the only way I can find out now is if I look at any extractor and ejector marks that are on there. Mm -hmm. If I were not to look at that and just see a 9, uh, it could also be from a revolver. There's a lot of companies now that are also making ammunition or making firearms that will also hold uh, these calibers originally for semi-automatics are now making it for revolvers. Wow. So, it, yeah, I have to really, really take a close look. I can't just make a quick assumption, oh, I have a 9mm or I have a 40 caliber and it's from a semi-automatic. And, uh, and it's already happened where a detective said, well, I don't have any cartridge cases on the scene. Okay, well, it's either the suspect picked them up, which does happen, mm -hmm. uh, they were kicked around, or, uh, or they're from a revolver. Uh, so we get, it's, we're get seeing some of that now uh, when it comes to uh, it's being chambered, whether used in moon clips uh, or it's good. So how about common, how about common revolver ammunition like uh, 38 caliber? Are you seeing them in semi-automatic? Is that possible? Well, the third, there is a, a 38. You have a 38 class of all different types of uh, cartridges. Uh, we have, of course, there's a 38 super that's in semi-automatic. Uh, we don't see a lot of that turned around. Uh, with some of your revolver cartridges, but there's some are interchangeable, like uh, your 45 auto, uh, your 22 caliber, uh, are interchangeable between uh, revolvers, cell, and uh, semi-automatics, rifles, and so on. All right, let's go to the next slide, uh, Laura. All right, now let's talk about class characteristics versus individual characteristics. All right, so you have a um, you have a a bullet yes. from a crime scene or wherever it might be. Uh, and let's make believe that slide is a bullet that, uh, that's been found at a crime scene. Describe it to us. What kind of characteristics are there uh, in reference to class? Okay, well, whether it's a bullet or actually it looks more like a, a barrel of a, it would have been a barrel. You see, you see let's it. make a believe it's a bullet. Oh, okay, well, okay. I believe it's a bullet. If you uh, say so, it's your, it's your show. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, as you see on the, on, the, on the right side, that there's a series of um, uh, lands and grooves. Uh, which are lands and grooves are the rifling in a barrel, and lands are the raised portions in a barrel, and grooves are the shallow portions in a barrel. So and what are they there for? So what they are is to give a the bullet its stability in flight. When it make when the bullet gets uh, it gets pressed by the lands and grooves, I should say by the lands, and uh, it gives it its stability. It gives it a rotational spin uh, in the barrel, so it has a more direct uh, uh, direct trajectory in flight. And it could be in a right hand or left hand twist. Uh, it depends on what the manufacturer wants to do. Does so there's it matter? A, doesn't matter. And, and it, it was a time where you thought when people thought, well Colt would do uh, uh, six make a six left barrels and they were all they were famous for that. And people thought, well, you know, Colt uh, because they were they were new, they were very popular, that left hand twist must be much better for the bullet for the trajectory in flight rather than right hand. And Smith and Wesson with a class characteristic of six left, Smith and Wesson would be making five rights. We're going to make it a little different here. Now we got we're doing five with a right hand twist, but it really doesn't matter whether it's right or left. It all. Uh, but forensically, that helps you. It, it does, not? and it does because there's um, uh, because the class characteristics I'm looking at is say what caliber is it? That's a class characteristics. How many lands and grooves, and then what twist? Uh, and I have a TRC or a general rifling characteristic file that will, um, if I had to measure the widths of the lands and grooves, I can narrow it down as to what type of firearm where the likelihood it was that, that was used if I don't have a firearm that came into my lab. Uh, other a good, good example for a class characteristics uh, that even if the bullet is is destroyed, because it depends on what it hits. Uh, sometimes I have a pristine bullet that comes from the victim. Mm -hmm. Other times it's mangled. Well, and so same thing at a scene or whatever. Here's a good example with class characteristics: um, high point firearms. Very familiar with high point firearms. We get them in. They're, they're a lower quality firearm. Uh, uh, however, we get many of them in. The uh, the owner. Of, of High Point, Mr. Tom Deebs, is uh, he has tried. He has worked with the forensic community for many years to help us out, as firearms examiners, help us out to at least determine. Looking at a at a, at a bullet specimen, what we call it a bullet specimen when it's fired, what firearm, what manufacturer it maybe came from. So what he's made is unique. If I have a bullet that comes in and it's mangled, but I could still able to determine how many lands and grooves are imparted onto the bearing surface of the bullet mm -hmm. and a twist. Uh, what he's done was make it, 
he made his barrels where nobody else has, for example, a 9 left in a 9 millimeter, a 7 left in your 40s. Uh, that's just an example where no one, as of right now, no other manufacturer makes 7 left barrels. Unless, unless it's uh, Unless it's an aftermarket, as in somebody you know is specific, I want a seven left. So that's a class characteristic, and then I would measure the, the lands and grooves to determine the widths of them as to right. what type of firearm. All right, in so the interest an of example. time, Laura, we're going to go through the slides a little bit faster here, and uh, we'll just make Can a we couple talk of quick faster. Time. Uh, no, don't don't talk any faster. <laughs> no. Um, okay, go to the next one. Okay. Um, Explain the, the rifling brooch. That's the one that, that actually makes the lens and grooves, is that correct? Yes, there's different types of rifling tools, uh, whether it be what we call push button or your traditional uh, cut rifling. Uh, rifling brooch, this, the one you're showing there, is a, is a very common one for many manufacturers. And what that does is that tool that, um, uh, that you see on the top left of your screen is it gets pulled through the barrel after the barrel is after the stock of steel is, is drilled out and uh, it reamed and then it gets rifled by using that tool. So when it so if I had a full tool that use that thing is just a portion. It's usually about it's usually a couple feet long. Really? It's attached to a it's attached to a big machine and it gets pulled uh, through the barrel uh, of the firearm to make give it its rifling. And uh, and if if you saw the entire tool you'll see how each parts are actually are different sizes. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the lands you see all the way the lands and the grooves are, and uh, it, and those are where a lot of times you leave, you see the unique striated uh, striations or characteristics left behind by the tool that was used to manufacture your rifle barrel. Okay, ideally we believe uh, generally that no two barrels will leave the same individual characteristics. Otherwise, they're not individual characteristics. Right. They can leave a lot of similar marks or but, impression or striations, I should say. But my question is, and I don't know the answer to this, and okay. I hope maybe you do, how many barrels does will one rifling brooch make? Uh, that's a good question, and I get asked that often, and I've been through many of the uh, firearm manufacturers up and down the, uh, up in the uh, New England states. Uh, for example, you mean the New England Patriots are? Is that what? Is that correct? <sighs> yeah, what it did. Yeah, the ones who don't know how to actually all right, inflate all right, balls. I, I can I st anyway. St stick with the topic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> go Eagles. Anyway, so uh, with the rifling brooch, and I've been to many of the manufacturers, including Colt, Smith & Wesson, uh, Mossberg, Sturm River, just name a few. Uh, it depends on the on the manufacturer. These brooches, uh, they've used them several hundred times. And a long stock of steel before they discard it and use a new brooch. Uh, if they're using that particular brooch or any of the tools that they use, uh, they use they have several hundred. Uh, one manufacturer has used it. Um, oh, this is many years ago. They said uh, close to a, a, a thousand barrels after it's cut using the same tool, and it starts wearing down and not leaving uh, a distinct shoulders on the well, lands and groups. we want it to wear down, I would think. We want it to change. So, well, with each passing, there's new there's new striated uh, striations and characteristics that are left behind on the barrel. Uh, so with each new passing of these tools, leaves new striated marks. And though you can, I can look at, and, I, and here's a quick example, I'll try to be quick. Ruger had a great, has a great test that I did many years ago, the 10 barrel test, where they took a long stock of steel and they cut in 10 pieces and they drilled it out and they rifled it using the same tool and they gave me known standards of the bullets, all right, saying these bullets came from this particular barrel, barrel one through 10, mm -hmm. and here's a whole set of other bullets that came from these barrels and you have to determine which of these bullets came from which barrel using your standard your standards mm -hmm. of bullets? Uh, and fortunately, I passed. Uh, but it was it was not easy because there was a lot of similarities, and I would mm -hmm. see some striations on some of the landing grooves that are lining up together. However, that's where I have to look at each landing groove from the beginning of the bearing surface to the very end of the bullet, where it, what we call where it starts with the ogive, where it start the bullet starts to curve. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to look at each land and each groove. And to make a determination, okay, this came from this gun. And if I'm not a hundred percent sure, and this is it in my in my discipline now, if I'm not a hundred percent sure, uh, I'm not calling it. I'm just not. We have a range of conclusions. It is the farm. It isn't the farm. And then somewhere in between, it could be. However, 
uh, because of either damage or the, the barrels is very worn out uh, or it's been it's been uh, modified. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's just a revolver. We talked about that, and this is the type of uh, uh, weapon that, uh, after it's fired, the uh, the shell stays in the cylinder. in the cylinder. You'll yeah. see the chambers of the cylinder on the bottom right, and you got a swig out cylinder, and you have what we call break open uh, uh, on the bottom the top, or we have here a, a TB a top break. Next one. Semi-automatic firearm. You have a Beretta, I see, as an example, where you have your source of ammunition as your magazine, and you'll see the top part is your slide, and uh, and that's where you put the magazine into the magazine well. The top, the cartridge on top of that magazine or the, or the follower is uh, at the, is right behind in the, the rear of the barrel, and you'll see the slide will have to be uh, pulled to the rear and under spring tension, falls forward, uh, strip of that round. Out of the magazine into the barrel, and uh, and once the the so, fire. So it as it strips it into into the uh, um, chamber, and then fires it, and then kicks it out. That those two extra steps cause for additional individual characteristics. Yeah, there's the extractor and ejector I talked about earlier. Okay. Extractor just like a extractor claw, it forces it out of the barrel, and the ejector actually forces it out of the ejection port or the cutaway of the slide, normally on the right side, uh, most popular on the right side of a, of a firearm, a semi-automatic firearm, I should say. Next one. All right, go to the next one. <laughs> All right, now, this uh, this is where the firing pin comes from? Yes, you'll see here in the middle there's a hole, there's an opening there, there's a firing pin in there, and that's where, that's the breech of the firearm. Uh, that's where the, uh, the, the cartridge case uh, will slam to the rear and leave it in a, an impression from the manufacturer marks that you may be able to see some impressions on there uh, when a firing pin protrudes, uh, striking the primer of the cartridge. And on the top left of this picture, it appears that you have a uh, what is a an extractor that helps hold it, it goes around the rib of the cartridge case. That's yeah. I we'll, think that's we'll what that is. There. Yeah, go to the next one. Oh, and there's your ejection port. Uh, you're looking at the side of the slide where you see the cartridge case and the rim is being pulled out or extracted out of the rear of the barrel. That rear of the barrel is that silver-looking part of the of the, uh, the photo there. And then it'll be ejected out of that ejection port. How often do you are you able to make identifications with extractor and ejector? Mark? Well, I don't make an identification. Well, if I have an identification of extractor and ejector, I can note down that it was fired or it was extracted and ejected in the same firearm, but I can't say it was fired in because you can extract and eject and chamber uh, cartridges oh, in there without firing. Correct, it. correct, correct, correct. Okay. <laughs> All right, but the shell, anyways. Yes, yeah, the yeah. cart. Yes. All right. Next. Next, and that's okay. There's a firing pin that, that apparently was under spring tension, protruded through the breech face uh, of your firearm. So that's what you're looking at. Let the me tip ask of you about the breech face. Mm -hmm. the, the, the breech is the back part of the yeah. Chamber, it's, it's, right? Yes, uh, yes. Sir. Now, when the gun is fired, and the base of the shell smashes up against that breech block, does it tend to leave an impression that might be seen sometimes? Have you? I, are you ever able to make identifications with breach uh, marks? Well, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the breach impressions that are left behind on the primer of the cartridge uh, case and also on the where the head stamp is. Mm -hmm. Head stamp is right outside the primer of the head mm -hmm. stamp of the cartridge. Uh, and I'm looking at also the firing pin impression. And even if an identification can't be made, uh, there are times that manufacturers leave class characteristics behind that I can tell you, for example, uh, which most commonly the type of firing pin impression is hemispherical, but Glock, for example, leaves an elliptical, almost looks like a, uh, yeah, an elliptical firing pin impression, uh, very unique to Glock, and in the older Smith & Wesson Sigma series firearms when they were first manufactured. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, at, now d why do they do, do they do that to help you, or they just do it to be different? <laughs> Uh, well, because it doesn't. doesn't well, we're told help. a little bit. We're told. You know, they. I guess they. They like placate to us when we're up there talking to them and say, "Oh, we're helping the firearms community." Mm -hmm. uh, they probably are to a. Uh, well, they are to a degree. However, uh, there's uh, yeah, some of these manufacturers say they're doing it just because it it it'll uh, it works better 
in the firearm. It, it you know it's okay. It holds they, up they, better. That's how they market it, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, Next, simply one. enough. <laughs> okay. Next one, Laura. Okay. Now we're looking down the barrel. Okay. Keep on going because we're looking at time and uh, and. Uh, Unfortunately, no. these slides are linear. Okay, here's, here's a an one. example of the bullet. It's a good example. The bullet looks like it was uh, exiting the barrel, and you'll see that there's uh, striated patterns onto the bullet, and that's from the rifling of the bullet uh, of the barrel, and uh, it parted itself onto the bullet. So I'm looking at all uh, those unique striated patterns. If you were looked at a barrel, uh, obviously when it's empty, uh, you'll see it looks almost like a mirror-like finish. Mm -hmm. But if you look under the microscope you'll see all those unique uh, scratches or striations from we the manufacturer that's now placed that on the bearing that. surface of the bullet. Okay, Laura. You, you know, you talked about the fact that uh, sometimes the uh, bullet gets damaged. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. There's still forensic value to that? Absolutely, mm -hmm. especially that, that image there. That's just the top part of the bullet that expanded upon impact. But I'm looking at uh, most of the uh, fired bullets or projectiles I'm looking at the bearing surface, the very base edge, the bottom of it. It leaves usually it usually leaves the best impressions or striations from the barrel is right at the very end. Because when the, when the bullet is tapering in, it's not hitting the lands and grooves. Therefore, it's not picking up any individual. You get some at the very end of the bearing surface, but uh, the majority of the times, the first thing I look at first location I look at is the uh, at the base of the bearing surface or the bottom of the bullet and actually that's a that's a great specimen but I have others that are just uh, a portion of because mm -hmm. they've tore apart yeah. uh, or they've expanded all the way down where I have to readjust the bullet to get to be able to look in, uh, on these bullets uh, on the microscope next one okay and there's your cartridge case next go to the next one next one <laughs> Next one. Now this is this is tip. Uh, there's a water tank. And well, that's a water tank. That's all. And what we have is <laughs> you have a much fancier. We one. have a better. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. That's an older picture, isn't it, Tom? Mm -hmm. That's not you, is it? No, that's not me. Thank okay, because you. no. uh, you're much better looking now. <laughs> so anyway, the uh, the uh, the tank we have is a large steel tank full of water. And uh, there's a lid that we put down so there's a, the water doesn't splash up to uh, to the examiner. We have a tube that goes into that tank, and we that's test fire old, it there. That's old AT, That's ATF lab. Yeah, uh, ATF. Ago, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're, they're, yeah okay. So uh -oh. that's where you <laughs> so you fire it into the water tank, and that's where you get you get a pristine pristine bullet uh, that should reflect all the individual characteristics that that gun at that time. Yes, Please. at that time. Now, keep in mind the reason why we use water. Simply enough, it slows the velocity of the bullet, uh, so I can uh, so I can uh, recover that uh, bullet. I don't want to leave any additional fire markings uh, on the bullet. Um, I want to see just what came from the from a rifle barrel. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the forensic buddy? It's it's a big oh, cone yeah. with rubber balls. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I only know that because. Um, we used one to get some bullets for our lab that the Maryland State Police let us borrow. And I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Does that work? I mean, it just it seems... doesn't work. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly stops them, which I was shocked. Well, it does. You look at it, and you wouldn't think it would, but yeah. it's actually. Uh, I think Savage uh, Snail Systems uh, mm -hmm. is the manufacturer. But I would think water would be better. Yeah. Well, water is better, but this is uh, those. I said uh, water. Well, you're way well, yeah, water, whatever. <laughs> this is water. I'm sorry. This is a little filly in me. A little water. Uh, yeah, you say water, I say water with two O's and a D. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, water is better. And uh, it, But the balls, you have to, it, that's usually some, those equipment, you usually see them on a scene if you have to test fire on location of occurrence mm -hmm. uh, or if you don't have the f type of facility to be able to have a large water tank. Uh, so they are good, but the balls, uh, they are designed to not leave uh, unique scratches on the bullet. Uh, but yeah, you're, I'm surprised I look at them and see how well yeah. they do work. Yeah. Up to a certain caliber, I know. Next one. Next one. Keep going. Keep going. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, now we, we can see a little bit better. In, in, what I've done is this is actually a slide for my class okay. showing where the forensic value of the bullet yes, is. Sir. Um, in this is shows a little bit better those striation marks that you yes, were talking about, and those stri So 
let's make sure we understand, the viewers understand. So those marks are caused because when the rifling brooch carved out those lands in grooves, because of the quality of the metal never stays constant, uh, you, you have... I call them defects. I like to use, you know... That's, that's a good, in layman's terms, that's a good word. Yes, yeah, you know? Sure. And so when the bullet slides down, it, it hits those defects, causing those scratches. That's a good way. That's a very good explanation. I, I try to make it very simple with my students. Well, you're awesome, so that's good. Yeah. Okay, go to the next one. <laughs> All right, so here's an example. Uh, um, of, of, a, of a comparison microscope. Yes, split screen. you see a vertical uh, uh, line. Uh, and you have an image on the left, image on the right, two different bullets, and that's what I'm looking on a microscope using different magnification and lighting uh, to look at all those scratches and striations to make a determination. And they're not quite together. Go to the next slide, and I think you'll see... Yeah, that's a little it, off there. No, it's going to be on next one. There you go. There you go. Because right. the other one you could have a little, almost looks like it, sh it should be matching up. Uh, however, this is uh, excellent. This is a good uh, view right here. So the land, the, 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 the dark line there is where is the land where the land and grooves match. Yeah, the dark line you see that's uh, that's uh, horizontal. That's actually like the shoulder mm -hmm. of the uh, of the land and groove right there. Uh, and that's how I would measure it too if I need to measure the lands and groove widths uh, starting from shoulder to shoulder in your traditional rifling. Okay, next. Alright, now here, this is an exercise uh, where the left uh, the left side is a fatal bullet that came from a crime scene, okay. right? and the right side is a, uh, is a test fired bullet. Go to the next one. And this is the bottom half of the uh, of the of the uh, suspect bullet, and then the next one is is the um, test fired bullet, and then go to the th uh, la next slide, and then one more slide, and you can start seeing. I see what uh, you're doing. Okay. Uh, uh, the, those marks. Now let me ask you a question again, and I'm asking you a question that I don't know the answer. To. Is that enough to make an identification right there? No. What, what, what you have there? Yeah. No. Okay. No, that's why I have to look at the totality of all those lens of grooves and all those striations from bearing surface to uh, from the base to the edge to make a determination because they, they, uh, you can have a few of those scratches. It's not like fingerprints where you have to have so many number of points to make right. an identification. Well, uh, what we found from the Mayfield case, you know, uh, an, an important case uh, from the uh, terrorist attack in, in Spain, uh, that there is... We used to think there was a standard for fi uh, for fingerprints, where anywhere from six to twelve points. And right. then after the Mayfield case, we found out there is no standard. Okay? Yeah. yeah so, was... and I know there's no specific number. So, I, I, so how many how many striation marks uh, do you have to go completely around the bullet to find them in in every land and groove area? I have to. Uh, that's where the uh, the training and the experience comes in. Uh, in my discipline to make a determination. Uh, there is no actual count of lines. That's what's, that, there are some uh, uh, persons you know, out in the West Coast in California, for example, who are trying the CMS or consecutive match and striae uh, to actually, let's call line counting. Mm -hmm. and it's not generally accepted in the forensic community. It has been attempted, but because of, it depends on the, you know, because of the bullet and its type of condition, you can have a pristine bullet versus a one that is mangled, torn, mutilated, and so forth. And that's why I have to look at, from experience and from training, to look at all the, what I know is uh, unique striated patterns versus far markings. To, and also we have a, a secondary examiner who peer reviews, uh, who also will look at it to determine if, if we can make a call on the, on the firearm, or, or on the bullet, I should say. Does it happen where you do an examination, right? you feel comfortable that you have enough stria to make an identification. It goes to quality control. Uh, okay, peer, peer review. Peer, peer review. Uh, they agree. Uh, do they do it independently or do they look at your work and, and agree, agree or disagree? Oh, well, first of all, with, with, that's good. with the peer reviewing, uh, in my laboratory, we witness each other test fire in the firearm. Okay? Uh, what I do, if I have uh, uh, fired evidence, I'll go on the microscope, make my determination, and uh, without saying anything, I'll tell my examiner, uh, hey, I have some evidence to look on the scope, have you look on the scope, tell me what you think. I don't want to say to him or her, 
yes, it's a match. No, it's not a match. Uh, eh. Tell me what you think, uh, what you feel. And uh, they'll go through everything I did. They do everything I did with, uh, with rotating the bullet, uh, looking at all the evidence to make a determination, and then we'll corroborate as to uh, what our uh, range of conclusions will be. Uh, so, All right, so you do that. Yes. Uh, you're comfortable. You're going to testify. You testify in, in court to, to your examination. Yes, sir. Defense turns around and goes and hires a retired firearm identification with just as much experience or more or less. doesn't matter. He or she says, uh, I don't agree. Okay. I, I, I need. Uh, <laughs> so at that point, it's the 12 people who weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty have to decide which one they want to agree. <laughs> Basically, I, I, that, I, I, the, 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 uh, the does exam that happen a lot, by the way? Uh, no, actually, with independent examiners, uh, many of the independent examiners that I have had experience with uh, are very uh, on the level. They're they're good people. Well, but no, no, and, no. no and I haven't had any problems with that so far. I haven't had any experience with these independent examiners coming in, re-examining the evidence, and coming up with a totally different range of conclusions. Right. Uh, however. Does that happen or has it happened? Yes, and it can happen. But that's their opinion. Right. And right. this is my opinion, and that's what I. And then, then the jury has to with. decide yeah, which this one is, it was. This is my this one. And also, it's my career. Sure. Uh, that's why there's a range of inclusions uh, where I'm not going to. I can't just assume that I have fired evidence with that gun and, and it was fired with that gun. That's why I have to test fire. That's why I have to look at uh, to make sure that this evidence was fired with that fire or another one. Okay. Now, next slide. Okay. No, uh, image. It, no. This is a breach. A breach mark. Yeah, you're showing me a. Uh, you have a photo of a breach face of a of a uh, head. You know, we see the head stamp on the right of the caliber. Looks like 38 special. Uh, it's of a cartridge case, and in the middle there is a firing pin impression, which is indented into the primer of the uh, of the cartridge. Okay. Next one. All right, now this is shells. another one of those exercises, and go to the next one. And what, what they're showing here is, uh, on the left-hand side, they're showing imp uh, impressions uh, uh, from the firing pin. Yes. On the right, on the right side, see the white areas? Uh, the, the, the author of the book, again, these are exercises, are saying, hey, this is from the flash of the camera. Don't look at them as individual characteristics. That's because correct. sometimes they'll see the white marks. And yeah, say, no, oh. that's, that's all. That's a washout. We call it. Yeah, is that what the a washout? Call washout. You don't want to look at that. Yeah, right. you try and. Uh, that's why we have. We I use different lighting. Uh, change the lighting around and the magnification because mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to. I don't want the washout. I try to eliminate that as much as possible because it could impede my Good. examination. Next one. Okay, let's talk about. Uh, uh, the the national uh, the national integrated ballistics information network. Mm -hmm. Now, do all fifty states uh, contribute uh, ammunition unknown or known ammunition to uh, what is it? Nibin is that how they? Nibin, it? yeah, right. It's it was it used to be Ibis and now it's Nibin and then we have in our offices brass tracks, and it's um, it's being monitored by FTI Forensic Technology, uh, and I, I'm aware of every state uh, has a database, and there's different regions uh, within the country. And actually, there's a nine, there's nine systems throughout the world in different parts. Are, are you required? Is well, is is your uh, lab required uh, to enter? All your cases into Nibin, if it is what we call Nibin worthy, uh, meaning we only put in semi-automatic uh, uh, cartridge cases, or I should say cartridge cases that came from a semi-automatic firearm. Uh, as no of right bullets? now, it's a protocol. No, no bullets. No, the, the system does not have the capability. The system we tried years ago when Ibis came to be, and uh, that. We, there was being bullets we were being entered, but we were having a very unsuccessful rate uh, with um, uh, with making any type of identification. The technology is not quite there as it is for uh, as cartridge cases that we put in. Now some laboratories throughout the country still do put some bullets in. Uh, we had very little success. Uh, many labs have very little success and no longer 
you, a, a bullet zone right. because of its condition. You need a really pristine bullet overall to get a good identification. Okay, so let, let's let's put a put this in, a, in, eyes, in, a, in a practical uh, situation. So you have uh, uh, cartridges found at a crime scene. Uh, you never found the gun. Maybe it's a cold case. You haven't even found a suspect. Okay, happens often. So you take those uh, car uh, and you put them in Nibis. Yes, in, in right. an Ibis system. Yeah. Okay. In the event that that um, the gun that fired those uh, is ever used again and possibly obtained, all right, um, then if that agency puts it into IBIS, you might get a hit. That's correct. We do it. What happens is uh, a correlation will then be. Now that happens all the time in CSI. <laughs> well, of course it does. Well, remember, CSI but has to, has to solve is, everything within the hour. But this is forensicweek.com. <laughs> How realistic is that? How often? Does that really happen? Well, we get a hit uh, in our laboratory. We do very well. We're, we're close to a thousand hits now, and uh, a thousand hits yeah, with, with with using uh, with using our it was uh, with Ibis. Now it's not. Now we have what we call brass track system and a match point system that we are close to the thousand hit mark, cold hit mark, not not hits. Let's say detectives say check this case against this case, and it's a hit, and we put it in Ibis. It's cold. It's we don't, and uh, we have a region, for example. Maryland area is region six, so it, it correlates everything. All the systems correlate against the ATF and FBI uh, systems. But in my region, I correlate. It all does an automatic correlation. The computer does against uh, Baltimore uh, County, Prince George's County, uh, uh, MSP, Maryland State Police, uh, even uh, Virginia. It, for some reason, Ohio. Uh, it is a region, and it comes back with NFDC, of course, and it comes back with uh, the correlations will come back after so much time, depending on the, the system and how much evidence is in there. It come back with a range of results, of possibilities, images, and I have to go through each of these images. Uh, and if I see that something looks like it could be related, for example, later on the firearm was recovered and a mm -hmm. test fire was put in by another county, and then that's where. I can, you know, if I see there's a possibility, then I got to bring the evidence back and uh, talk to the laboratory in question. Let's say Baltimore County has has the firearm, and then we'll come together in one of our labs um, and and to make a determination if they were fired with the same car. But of course, if you get a hit and and they have and they have a suspect in custody. You obviously have to have some other type of evidence that connect them to your case. Yeah, we can't. If they have somebody in custody, I can't make a, a hit that quick on Ivan. That does not does not happen. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> but I'm saying, whenever you make the hit, sure. I that doesn't put that suspect at your crime scene. It puts the gun there. It puts the gun there, yes. and then you hope to have some other evidence. Yes, uh, sir. That might relate. Okay, next one. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Rifle power Unfortunately, uh, we don't have control over the slides, so we That's just don't have to go with them. So go ahead. Next one. Um, Side uh, shells. A uh, uh, little bit. Just tell us a little bit about shotgun. Uh, the evidential value of shotguns. Uh, well, shotguns. Uh, most shotguns you have, uh, is, they're not rifled. Uh, they're smoothbored, and they could be uh, have a. They could be constricted at the end. Uh, what it all depends on the type of uh, shotgun that you want to constrict the pellets. Upon accident, the barrel uh, gives it its grouping. What type of grouping do you want? Depending on what you're you're aiming at, uh, if you're like, aiming at you know ducks or whatever, versus uh, turkey. So, but there are rifled barrels. Keep in mind. Uh, sometimes uh, we have barrels that are rifled. Uh, we have Sabo slugs, and there are different uh, uh, shot shells. How often do you see a rifled shotgun? Uh, we get them on a regular basis. Yeah. Really? Sure, absolutely. And uh, the shot shells, we look at, we, we everybody, the detective or the crime scene, uh, let's like say mobile crime detection unit, I want them to recover uh, any pellets they find because uh, there's all different size pellets depending on the manufacturer, depending on the, the size of uh, how it's loaded into the shot shell. Also, any type of cardboard or plastic uh, pieces that exit the shot that actually hold everything together. Uh, that's a pretty good picture you have there showing the different size of shot on the bottom right. Mm -hmm. And then your shot shells on the left that are the most uh, common calibers of shot shells that we have today. Uh, there used to be many more uh, many years ago, but those are the most common ones that we see on a regular basis. So let's see. Uh, yeah, we don't get four gauge too often or eight gauge, but we get the other ones on a regular basis. Very good. And we want we want us to get everything. We want to look at the uh, of all the, all the stuff that exits a barrel, much like the uh, image you have on the on the middle left. All right. Um, 
I want you to run through the slides to you if uh, I want to see some tool marks. Yeah, I just want to make sure the viewers see. Keep going. Oh, there's your projectile. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Sorry we have to do this, but... Uh, oh, okay. All right, right there. All right, uh, th this is an example. That's a piece of wire. Yeah, right, that's been yeah. cut in half. All yeah, right. we get proficiency tests uh, on every annually. We have to be uh, do proficiency tests to keep up on our on my discipline, and uh, uh, we get tool mark tests. And that's a good example. We do a copper wire. We get uh, or any type of wire. Uh, we've gotten uh, hoses that are cut uh, to determine if they were cut with the same instrument or tool, whether it be scissors, whether it be uh, uh, wire cutters. So when the blades just cut through the wire, uh, the it leaves the same similar striation marks than the, as the bullet when it's going down yeah, the barrel. it leaves that those manufacturer markings. Right, so that's what I'm looking at. Go to the next at. one. All right, and, um, and, and there's an example of, is that identification? What do you think? Well, I'm not going to make an identification on just photographs alone. Uh, I like that. Okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. But it, it's promising. <laughs> it's promising. Okay. <laughs> I put that. Get rid of the slides. Thank you, uh, Laura. Um, you know, I, I look at time. Uh, one yeah. of the things that's important. It's a lot to, uh, there's a lot to do with it. Absolutely. Us. But uh, what's important in Forensic Week is talk a little bit about the career field. You know, there uh, we have viewers who might be interested in, hey, I'd like to be a firearms uh, um, examiner. You indicated you started out in police work. What brought you from going from the police to be an examiner? Uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, opportunity, uh, the, the fascination of, of knowing that the firearms examination and wanting to know the whole history and uh, uh, of identification, uh, the whole discipline itself is pretty fascinating. So there was an opportunity for me to uh, uh, to be uh, to be transferred off the street uh, in Philadelphia and go into the firearms laboratory where I conducted approximately three year formal study. Takes approximately three years of formal study to become a firearms examiner. Follow we follow training guidelines by AFTI. AFTI is an acronym for the Association of Firearm and Toolmark Examiners, for which many <laughs> yes, for which many of us are members, including myself, uh, where I've been a regular member, for example, since 2000. And uh, following those training guidelines, all those things we just talked about in the past hour, plus in-house having to learn the nomenclature of all different types of firearms, the history of uh, the get familiar and uh, and uh, proficient with all the instruments that are involved, as you've seen in the lab. But today. Mm -hmm. um, do we it's still see people? Now. Do we still see people moving from 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 the street as a police officer into the lab, or are you hiring people in the lab that their career field focused on working in a crime lab? Well, what's happening now because of accreditation processes that we have, like we're ISO accredited now, ISO that more and more laboratories. Yes, more and more laboratories are. What does ISO stand for? I, oh, oh, it's a, it's an international standards. Okay. Uh, uh, and more and more laboratories are being civilianized, for example, and firearms are being civilianized, where at the time you, you can you still be a sworn officer and go right into the, into the lab mm -hmm. and be trained if you'd like, uh, whether you have a degree or not of anything. Now what's happening through all these accreditations, uh, now it requires that you have to have at least a bachelor's degree. Um, some departments, doesn't matter what type of bachelor's degree, Others, for example, they want some type of scientific bachelor's degree to be eligible to actually go into the laboratory to be formally trained. So there's actually not actually a, there's actually a university or a, a degree of firearms. There's a degree that you, as we all, I think most of us know, there's you can get a forensic degree of some sort. Uh, but, uh, but that's what we need now. So uh, those with a degree. Uh, at least a bachelor's degree can uh, go in a lab, as opposed to just being a police officer having no experience, no bat, no degree, can't just go into most labs. There are still some labs that have uh, sworn officers, such as Philadelphia still has them, and, and Pennsylvania uh, uh, police. I know we're at the 60 minutes, but yeah. the nice thing about uh, um, a webcast TV show is, you know, we don't have to worry about time. So we're gonna we're gonna okay. go about five more, five uh, ten more minutes. Um, oh, okay. Uh, be, because Over I, time. I, I okay, think good. I think I think uh, this is important. Uh, so let's say um, a student uh, wants to work in a crime lab. Sure. Uh, might be interested in firearms identification. Sure. Not sure. Okay. Uh, he's in college now. Uh, what do you re recommend he or she should major in uh, with future 
uh, thoughts of working in the crime lab and possibly firearms identification? Well, uh, similar to what I just mentioned, uh, get into the field of any type of forensics uh, and any type of uh, science in the, within the forensic field. What I also recommend is them trying to do a uh, an internship, if possible, if they're if for example, Baltimore Police has an internship program, as you know, uh, and trying if they're interested in firearms, we have interns that come in uh, once going through a background check and so on, and they're with us for could be a couple weeks to to a couple months. Uh, sometimes we've just had one not long ago had to do a thesis on on in reference to uh, something to do with firearms, uh, but that's the best thing. That actually gives you a great idea if this is what you want by like going in a laboratory being able to have some type of uh, short-term internship with us and really get to know not just the book uh, smarts, but know what, what really happens in a laboratory. And we show you around and, and it gets you to uh, all right, learn so, all the instruments. So you get hired by a, uh, a crime lab and uh, you show an interest in firearms identification and you get put into that unit. What's the training process? The training process is much like uh, what I had to do. You go through a formal three-year formal study. There's a training guidelines. Uh, but what do you? I mean, do you go somewhere? I mean, well, you will. Kind well, of program. Well, there's a, that's a whole that's a whole other thing. With so a lot of the training that you can be signed off on by doing things in house. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, outside uh, training, such as uh, armorers courses, uh, fire manufacturers. That I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, uh, serial number restoration. Uh, uh, class through usually through ATF, uh, so you can be proficient with doing with trying to restore serial numbers on a firearm or any type of uh, or any other type of instrument or uh, anything that's uh, evidence. There is an actual program if you, if you're lucky enough to get into that's a um, uh, it's like a firearms academy. Uh, I think that's through uh, I believe it's through ATF that you can get in, you can try and get in and uh, and then most of the training is through this academy. Uh, as opposed to us doing it in house, but you would have to get hired. You'd get hired by the crime lab, then you would go to that academy. As far as uh, yes, if, uh, you have to be hired and then be recommended, and be lucky enough to be on the list uh, to do that. Chris, I, I just think that we've just scratched the surface. And, oh, it's, it's so much been, more. Been, been an hour, but yeah. I, I think uh, we've given our viewers a good taste of what firearms identification and so. yeah. is, and i uh, love to have you back uh, another time. I want to thank uh, your boss, Steve O'Dell, the director of the uh, uh, Baltimore Police Crime Yeah, Lab. he's a good guy. Uh, Steve and then my supervisor, Sandy, Sandy Boland, good supervisor. So it always helps to have some good people around you. Absolutely. Uh, we uh, they, They've been very supportive uh, yes. of, our, of our program at the University yes, of Maryland. Yeah, and people. Steve was on the show. And <clears throat> yeah, I heard. And, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, Laura and I were at the American Academy of Forensic Science Conference, and uh, we spent uh, some time with Steve, and uh, uh, we really appreciate what he does and uh, what he's done for you. And, and I appreciate the, uh, that he, he uh, has uh, allowed himself and you to come in and talk here because, again, this is something we're trying to get the, uh, the message out and educate the future jurors out there uh, yeah. so they understand uh, what's really going. Well, uh, I want to thank you very much yes, and uh, um, I just want to tell our viewers that uh, um, we've got a show coming up and uh, um, it's the next show will be June 18th, uh, Lizzie Borden Update, a retrospective forensic analysis with Dr. Stephen Kane, psychologist. Uh, he was on our show back uh, when we did episode 17, which was Lizzie Borden, Nothing But the Truth. You may remember that. And uh, when the editor of the Hatchet Journal, which is uh, uh, the nice. journal that uh, focuses on Lizzie Borden, when the editor, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Curry, uh, heard that we were going to have Dr. Kane on, um, I asked her, I said, hey, would you like to come have an opportunity to... Uh, Talk with Dr. Kane. He has some new thoughts and new ideas and new philo new uh, uh, new theories on uh, Lizzie Borden in her mental state uh, during the time in question. Uh, so she said, absolutely. So we're we're really happy about the fact that uh, uh, Dr. Curry is also going to be on the show. So that's June 18th. Now, Dr. Uh, Kane is uh, is a member of the faculty. At the faculty at the University of Guam, so he'll be when we're doing our show on a Thursday evening, June 18th at 7 p.m. It'll be uh, nine o'clock the next day for him. 
Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, that's June 18th. And don't forget, uh, August uh, um, 2nd to the, uh, to the 8th um, is the American Academy Identification's 100th anniversary celebration, uh, uh, excuse me, anniversary celebration and educational conference in Sacramento. Um, I will be out there. We're going to be doing three live shows that week in, in various programs. In fact, I, I was talking with, uh, um, with uh, the person that runs their conference, uh, and we're going to, we're going to, uh, discuss uh, and plan three events during that week. So we'll. Uh, so, anyways, I want to thank everybody for watching the sh show this evening, and uh, we will see you next time on ForensicWeek.com. Thank you for watching. Welcome to the ForensicWeek.com show. I'm your host, Tom Moriel. This show invites experts from around the world that discuss educate and mentor those viewers who are interested in topics from the crime scene to the crime lab and everywhere in between. The show is broadcast live on Thursday evenings, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, then archived right here on our YouTube channel. We have listed each episode in convenient categories to make it easier for you to find a topic of interest. So if you're a student trying to learn about what career opportunities are out there for you, an educator looking for additional academic content for your courses. A practitioner who wants to increase your depth of knowledge or the general public who just wants to know. Then begin watching ForensicWeek.com right now. To stay informed about our next show, subscribe to this YouTube channel or just go to www.ForensicWeek.com. Thank you for watching.